Um, so we're going to move on to the keynote sessions now. It's three, uh, it's three short keynotes from um, three separate companies, obviously. Uh, the first one is Ravelin. And is Martin Sweeney here? He is, Martin. Uh, Martin's the CEO of Ravelin. Please, please come. Voting's over. Yep, I'm here. <laughs> How's it going? Yeah, good, thank you. Hello. Everyone hear me okay? So my name is Martin Sweeney. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Ravelin. And before I start, I want to remind you and take you back to the, the golden age of payment acceptance. In, in those heady days when merchants could decide for themselves which transactions to accept, when to use authentication, or when to go straight for authorization. And the chances are that since you're sat here, you know what I'm about to talk about. Uh, it's, the, it's the dreaded PSD2 here to spoil the party. And what that really means in practice is this thing called strong customer authentication, uh, which is an online parallel for the offline version, which is called chip and pin or EMV or some combination of the two, depending on where you're from. And the online version is called 3D Secure. And really what this means is you're asking your consumer, your cardholder, to prove that they are who they say they are before they try and pay for your goods or services. And until now, merchants have had the, the option to optimize their businesses as they see fit, and in some ways compete with other merchants on the best user experience that they can offer. Uh, now, the, the European Commission and the, the EBA have come up with PSD2 and the regulatory technical standards, which tell us that strong customer authentication is now required for online payments. And in practice, that means 3D secure. So if we take this very literally, we might say that this now means that all payments online have to use 3D secure. 3D secure on everything, which as a merchant should strike fear into your hearts. Your merchants, your customers rather, don't really like uh, 3D secure. You know, they, they on the whole uh, find the experience quite unpleasant. They find it a little confusing. They find it a little jarring at times. Uh, we, we've done a good job of telling people not to enter their online internet banking passwords into uh, strange looking websites and suddenly we're popping up a page that asks them for the, their password or a code that somebody sent them over SMS. Um, and particularly if you try and use it on mobile, you'll, you'll find that the experience is not really optimized for that since it was developed uh, you know, in the dark ages about 15 years ago, uh, mobile is a very poor domain, a poor channel for using 3D Secure. So thankfully not, there is, a, there is a way out. We don't have to just roll over and accept 3D Secure on every transaction that we want to process. We do have another way. Now the process, which you may have been part of, I hope you were, uh, when the European Commission and the EBA produced their first draft of the legislation which says, says we're going to fix fraud, guys, we're going to do it, we're going to fix this whole thing and we're going to require 3D Secure or something like it uh, for online payments and that's going to fix the fraud problem. I think the industry had a collective heart attack at that point. Everyone said, do you know that that's probably not the best idea? That might kind of break online commerce if you do that. So after a few rounds and some feedback that came from industry and merchants and a combination of industry bodies, um, a few drafts later we got this concept of exemptions. And that means times that you don't have to use 3D Secure for every transaction, when you don't have to authenticate that user before they try and pay. And there's a bunch of them, but the three I've pulled out here are the, the most interesting or the, the, the ones that are closest for you to be able to use today. Uh, and they are low value transactions, low risk transactions, and recurring transactions. I just put recurring there because it's interesting if you have a you know, Spotify type subscription where you, you bill nine, uh, nine pounds 99 once a month, every month. But I'm not gonna talk about it today, but let's assume that that is part of the picture. I'm gonna talk about low value, I'm gonna talk about low risk. 
So when, as a merchant, you see that transaction coming to you, you have to evaluate which exemption would I like to use, assuming that I don't want that user to have the friction and bother of actually going through an authentication step. So the first one, the, the most obvious and popular one, is uh, something called a low-value exemption. And that means if your transaction is under 30 euro, or depending on which, uh, which country you're in, that might be 30 pounds or another currency, uh, if that transaction is under 30 euros, you are eligible for an exemption with a big caveat that the issuer has to agree that this is worth taking the risk on in their eyes. Now, the trouble is that many of you merchants and other people in the industry will be able to tell me that low value is not necessarily low risk. There's plenty of fraud on low risk orders, sorry, low value orders. Um, now, the problem is if you seek an exemption, the trade-off here, just like today, is that if there's fraud, you, the merchant, or the acquirer in practice, is going to be on the hook for that, for that chargeback that may result as, uh, out of the process. So you still want to be able to make sure that if you're sending a transaction and flagging it as low value, you really know that it's actually still low risk at the same time. But the chances are that the issuers will agree on the whole that low value transactions as per contactless payments should be easy to use. They have a low liability and on the whole, it's something we can agree to. But there's a problem. So there's a caveat. There's something called the, uh, well, there's, a, there's, there's two dynamics here. You can only use this low value exemption if the issuer has not authenticated or has authenticated that user within six transactions, within five transactions, so the sixth has to be re-authenticated again, or the cumulative count of all the transactions that the issuer has processed on that payment instrument since they last authenticated is at or below 100 euros. So what this means from a merchant point of view is you are sat there with a transaction ready to process. You, you know it's 20 euros, therefore it's low value. I'm going to ask the issuer to, to process this with a, an exemption so I don't have to bother my customer and make them authenticate. And actually the issuer says, well, sorry, but this time it's transaction number six, so you have to force that customer to go through authentication. So this is a problem for merchants because your on the face of its simple exemption suddenly becomes a lot more complicated because the issuer has a black box into which we cannot peer and therefore we don't know for any low value transaction what's going to happen. And from my experience as a merchant and working with them, uh, merchants tend to want to know what's going to happen. You know, you want to be in control of your user experience. You want to make sure the conversion for your site or app is as positive as possible. Therefore, having a high degree of confidence on any given transaction, what's going to happen is important. So low value is easy to understand, but has some caveats within. The next exemption is, uh, is low risk. And the regulators, the EBA rather, have defined what transaction risk analysis is. And the trouble with transaction risk analysis is that it's fairly difficult. Uh, you know, I, I have some experience in this domain. I can tell you that we have a large team of people who are very good at their jobs working day and night to make this happen. So for a merchant, you're suddenly faced with the, with the challenge of evaluating each transaction and deciding whether it's low risk or not in order to qualify for an exemption. But also, as well as defining it, they've also made it very complicated. So if you could just all have a quick read of this and uh, consume it fully and tell me if you understand it. This is cribbed directly from the, the RTS, the Regulatory Technical Standards uh, for the PSD2 have published. Defining which mechanisms, as a minimum, you must take into account in the evaluation of that particular transaction. Everyone read it? Okay, now answer this question. Do you think that at the moment what you're doing, if you're using a rules engine, in particular if you're using something that your payment gateway is giving you for free or for a fee, that you can satisfy all of those different requirements that you definitely just read on the last slide? I would be impressed if, if you were compliant with that, which means there's a big challenge here. As a merchant, I want my customers to have the least friction in their journeys. And I want to know that if my payment is over 30 euros, I can evaluate that transaction. I have the most data. My, my gateway, my acquirer, my issuer know nothing about that customer compared to all the data I have. And so I have the ability to make the best judgment. But in order to do that, I have to go away and 
you know, reinvent the wheel and define all of these different requirements and make sure I'm compliant with them. But then on top of that, you have to ask the question, is my acquirer good enough for this? Because with the low risk exemption comes another caveat. As with low value, the caveat is the issuer has a counter that you, you have to hope is on your side. In low risk, the caveat is your acquirer's reference fraud rate, which means, in practice, if you take your acquirer and they add up all of the transactions they process for all of their merchants, and they add up all of the fraud across all of those merchants, they can work out their reference fraud rate. It's not for you as a merchant in individually, it's for the whole community, the, the full cohort. So your acquirer has to take a good hard look at themselves. Uh, and acquirers, by the way, tend to make the most money in the most high risk verticals. So most acquirers have a, shall we say, non-compliant today fraud rate. And your acquirer now is the key to you as a merchant being allowed to not use 3D Secure. So if you just go back to the very beginning, if you don't want to use 3D Secure because you think it's a bad user experience, your acquirer has to have a low reference fraud rate, and if they don't, you have to use 3D Secure on every single card transaction as of September. It's a little sobering, I think. Um, so you have to have a, an open and honest conversation with your acquirer, and you have to say, look, I think you should really be able to offer me this exemption, and that means that your reference fraud rate needs to be at some value, and my average transaction value is 120 euros, which means that you need to have a fraud rate of you know, somewhere between six and one basis point. And that's gonna be a challenge for a lot of acquirers. So as a merchant, I would get your contracts out and start looking at what your exit terms are from your acquirers and, uh, and really thinking hard about moving to someone who can offer you these exemptions. That's gonna be a really important thing for everyone come September. So let's say that your acquirer is good enough. They've communicated to you that, uh, yes, our reference fraud rate, and they probably won't tell you what the number is, but they probably say, we can give you exemptions of up to 100 euros, or up to 250 euros. But if your average transaction value, value is over 500 euros, then you have another problem on your hands. Every single transaction over 500 euros, no matter of its risk profile, has to go through 3D Secure unless your merchant is whitelisted with that issuer, another, another type of exemption for another time. But now let's think about when this applies. So we talk about both legs. That means acquirer and issuer have to be within the EEA, and, and that does include Brits, I'm happy to say. So if you think about the consequences of this, that means that if your card, if you, let's say you're a European business with a European acquirer, fraudsters are now going to realize in fairly short order that if they obtain a card from outside the EEA, then you as the merchant or acquirer don't have to turn on 3D Secure for that transaction, and therefore you become a greater target for fraudsters with access to non-EEA cards. So there are gonna be some interesting things that come out in the wash here. At the moment, you probably experience a greater failure rate or decline rate or fraud rate for international cards, that's going to change as of September as fraudsters and acquirers and issuers react to the new reality of PSD2. So, I've, I've, been, I've been really cruel to 3D Secure. I think you know, it's fairly clear that, that consumers hate it, but you know, we've had to deal with it for some period of time. But there is hope on the horizon, and the, the nice people at the EMV Co. committee have spent quite a long time producing a new version of 3D Secure, which, which is much better. Uh, 3D Secure 1, let's say, failed. 3D Secure 2 is better. Uh, and the, t the two core tenets of why it's better are that it provides a better user experience for that customer. Safe to say that redirecting somebody to a web page or popping up a uh, an interstitial or opening an iframe on your website is not a brilliant user experience. 3D Secure 2 provides a more native experience, which is to say less jarring. When you ask that person to authenticate with, your, with their issuing bank, it will now be done inside your app or on your own website and will look and feel still like 3D Secure. It will have the same logos, verified by Visa, MasterCard safe code, um, but it will still be inside your app. And so it would be a less jarring experience. The second principle is that at the moment as an issuer, you're very frustrated because when the user is trying to authenticate through 3D Secure 1, you don't really know too much about it. You don't know 
the history of that user. You don't know the device they're using. You don't know much about the merchant that's sending you that transaction other than their merchant ID. And 3D Secure 2 provides, in the protocol, a way for merchants or their acquirers or gateways to send more data about the user, the transaction, and the merchant through to the issuer so that they can make better decisions. And the better decision here is, should we let this user frictionlessly authenticate? And that's a really interesting concept. So at the moment, if you use a UK bank in particular, they're quite good at something called risk-based authentication, which is when, crudely, they, they drop a cookie on your browser, and next time you load the 3D Secure page, they say, yep, I've seen that device before. I don't need Martin to log in again, so I'll just grant him the liability-shifted authentication and get on with our lives. 3D Secure to formalize this, this in the protocol and allows your customers to hopefully experience frictionless authentication more often. The principle is simple. Give issuers more data, they will make better decisions. In practice, I have to be a little skeptical about how set up issuers are, especially as of September, to make those really educated decisions about which transactions to frictionlessly authenticate or not. But at the moment, 3D Secure 2 is the least worst option for you as a merchant, and I would strongly encourage you to adopt it. So, in summary, if you're a merchant, you need to be aware of this, and you need to be communicating to your business the fact that a storm is coming. And if you do nothing, if you don't change anything in your payment setup right now, come September, a lot more customers are going to be getting declined payments. A lot more customers are going to be frustrated, and your business is going to very quickly experience a rush of blood to the head and want to know why we weren't prepared for this. A first step should be talking to your acquirer. It should be having a grown-up conversation saying, look, guys, I know that on, uh, in normal years you would consider yourselves a medium to high-risk acquirer because that's how you make your money, uh, but you know, we need to talk pretty seriously about the fact that you need to be able to offer me exemptions. So can you? And if you can't, we need to start thinking about a different acquirer. I clearly have a, a dog in this fight because my business provides transaction risk analysis, so I think you should outsource it to us because we'll do a better job than anyone. But on balance, I think it's an easy principle to understand, which is, as the merchant, you have the most data about your customer. You have seen them for the longest time. You've known which devices they've used, which orders they've made, which other customers they relate to. And if you understand that, you have the most data and therefore can make the best decisions about which transactions to exempt and therefore assume the liability for because you evaluate them as low risk. You need to be very smart about which exemptions you actually use. I don't think it's safe to just blanket apply one exemption and hope the issue is accepted. Under the hood, I would strongly encourage you to have something that evaluates the individual performance of issuers. Certain issuers are going to take a very liberal approach to this. Come September, they might just do nothing. Other issuers will take a very compliant approach to this, and come September, they will draconianly decline all transactions not presented with authentication. And others will take a halfway house where they, they still support 3D Secure 1. If you want to use it, yes, we'll, we'll grant that. And if you don't, well, if you're a merchant we have some relationship with or we know you're a acquirer, we might take a, a light view of this. But for merchants, you are going to be somewhat subject to the whims of what issuers do. And therefore, if you have data on what they're doing in the live environment, you can elect to take sensible routes. And in practice, that means not only deciding which exemption to apply on a given transaction, but it also means deciding which authentication path to pursue. You might decide to pursue authorization first, fail over on a soft decline, seek an authentication, retry authorization. You might decide to do authentication first and then seek an authorization second. You might decide to use 3D Secure 1, even though you know that, merch, that issuer supports 3D Secure 2 because their risk-based authentication is better than their frictionless authentication under 3D Secure 2. So there's a whole lot of stuff going on here. But those, those heady days, the golden days of, of merchants being able to decide which transactions should use authentication and which shouldn't, i.e. today, they are over. Come September, it's a lot more complicated than that. And you need to get ready for it. And my, su my suggestion is that you adopt 3D Secure 2 as the least worst experience 
for the users when they do have to authenticate, because we all hate 3D Secure 1, so 3D Secure 2 can't be any worse. Um, but it does provide more data to the issuers to allow frictionless authentication, and it does also provide some interesting options in terms of seeking exemptions through authentication, which is a deeply policy wonk level detail, which I'm happy to discuss with any of you later. But for merchants, offers you the best chance of optimizing for the greatest acceptance within your customer base. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Thanks very much. Yeah.